people frequently say, you've never made a bad wine, you've never bottled a faulty beer, your pubs just don't pull bad pints from spoiled cakes. How do you do it? And, well, I do a lot of things, but I know what they're getting at. How do you eliminate taints and spoilage? The answer to that is no secret. I use chlorine. Lots of it. It works. And it's cheap. There's a tendency for recent graduates, those whose instruction is very fresh and dominant in their minds, and also new entrants to the industry, workers and investors who are at the peak of their conscientiousness, to say uh, chlorine causes cork taint, TCA trichloranosol. It's become necessary to reassert that taint by direct chlorination is scientifically baseless. These taints do contain chlorine, however, tainted drinks are caused by something else. I'll explain. Here's the kind of starburst that formed this earth we have in everything in it. Big Bang, all the elements liberated atomically and individually. They coalesce and begin to react as they want to do and so forth to the extent that we now have a world with halo anisoles. Here's a basic organic benzene phenyl group, hydroxy group, methylation, call that an anisole. Here are some halides, chlorine, and hey presto, trichloranosol, or tetrachloranosol, or pentachloranosol, or with different halides, um, call these bromine, tribromanosol, the dairy industry's traditionally favoured bromine. Luckily there aren't really anisoles in drinks that would make them poisons. There are phenols though. Whiskey can be reasonably phenolic, beer as well. Phenols are very important in wine. Red wines especially can have quite high phenolic content. And phenols can react directly with halides. They've known all about this halation of phenols since the very first days of sanitising water supplies. Warren and Barto, that's a 1920s paper. The mid centuries very strong on the sources of cork taint and water supply. And by the mid-90s, they were really hunting it down to every twig and branch of water distribution systems. Along the way, already by the 1950s, Birchall and others, it was established emphatically that it was the organic contaminants in the water stream that were tainting. It was never considered seriously that we would go retrograde on the use of sanitising agents. The quality improvement work was in eliminating these organics in the water stream, the cresols, phenols, coal tar, moulds, bacteria that are, that are the actual building blocks of tanks. We're getting to the practical reality, the applicable professional skill set of, of how to be a maltster or a distiller, or a brewmaster, or a winemaker. What on earth is going on if you're exposing your organics to chlorine? The basics of hygiene operations is that you defoul first in order for it to be clean, so you can send in the sanitising agents to get it hygienic second. Fouling on your liquid contact services, let's imagine these big ones are macromolecules, so it's the site of sugars for spoiler juice to feed off, proteins for haze and faults, organic acids for microbes to get hold of and get to work on. And of course, shelter, protection from being eliminated for microbes and their spores and their enzymes. So these wee ones, uh, Acetobacter for vinegar, Britannomyces for rotten ferments, Pediococcus for ropiness, wild ugly ferments, and these big ones are the macromolecules, so brewers, spent grains, concreted onto the side of the mash tuns, oxalates, beer stones, tartrates for wines, even, even biofilms in pubs and dairies and places in such heavy use that the surfaces are nowhere near dry or cleaned often enough. Chlorine can't help with that, and neither can your peracetic or your peroxide or your steam sanitizer or UV or gamma radiation or whatever else they're selling into the industry. They're all just exhausted on this irrelevant soiling. It's got to be bare surface foremost 
as we all should have learned before morning tea time when I first aimed this. Get it clean with your caustic, nitrophosphoric acid, detergent, pressure washer, scrubbing brush, and then send in the true sanitizing agents. Otherwise it's akin to just polishing your car without washing it first. That's like getting wax and mixing it with the mud and grinding them into your paintwork. Flat surfaces, smooth surfaces are readily sanitizable. Stainless steel, copper, glass, epoxy, the rubber of gaskets. These things are a common standard across foodstuffs. Porous surfaces take sanitation very poorly. They don't rinse well or quickly or completely. They hold on to product and that intermingles with cleaning agents and sanitizing agents and then these sanitizing agents in turn can be intermingled back into the product stream. This is cross-contamination or more properly adulteration by carryover it, and it's as deplorable as it sounds like when you can taste dishwater because you haven't rinsed your glasses properly. Drinks professionals should be professionally very chary of surface porosity. Wherever you see cement used or those weird food grade plastic thingies the policy is to give up on ever having them truly sanitary. Strictly hot water, steam only. Some substrates are both porous and reactive. Oak, cherry, chestnut, acacia, the cooperage timbers. We pay good money for their flavour reactivity, amongst the other dynamics that you get. And of course, reactive cleaning agents wreck that. They will persist in the surface as well, in the matrix, and spoil whatever drinks they're next used for as well. It's, it's worth revising these minimum professional standards. It's also worth demanding them, expecting them to be upheld. There is an angle I haven't yet covered off, and that is that these halophenols I've detailed are only taint precursors. They have to undergo a specific transformation to actually produce the haloanisoles, trichloroanisole, tetrachloroanisole, tribromanisole, that are the real subject of any discussion about taints in drinks. These are formed slowly, microbially, by the methylation of the central phenol. And that's been known, it's been reinforced under repeat investigation for half a century. It's spoilage microbes, fungi, mould, on the cork bark when it's stored, exposed, moist, black mould in the cement underfoot, filamentous fungi on pal pallets and architectural timbers if they've been impregnated with the bromophenol as a fire retardant, which is legally compelled in some contexts. Phenols that are halated, and then this halophenol uh, is O-methylated, and then this novel haloanisole somehow enters the product stream. It takes all of that in that order to end up with tainted drinks. That's it. Phenol, halation, methylation, contamination. It's a, it's a sorry tale. It's a disaster movie. And unfortunately, it has played out that way far too frequently. The ugly rumour that using chlorine for sanitation taints drinks. Well, I, I don't know why that rumour persists. It's certainly not a sufficient explanation, and it doesn't accord with the science. Um, it certainly hasn't died down the way it should, now that we, in theory, share the same body of knowledge and experience about trichloranosol and the wider subject of this kind of taint. The misrepresentation that sanitising with chlorine is in itself the cause of taints in drinks, well, it's not exactly counterfactual, but it's nowhere near correct enough.